said this would be a good idea because we have so many wonderful elders in our congregation. Uh, among them, I am an elder, but I don't have the wisdom part, so we decided to get some other people for that. What we are going to do today, I've asked each one of our speakers today to spend about eight minutes going over the following, so you'll know what, what they're going to be talking about. A brief overview of any life experiences they want to share, how they came to be Unitarians, any special memories about UUCD, any committee or board involvement, and what it is that keeps them coming back to UUCD. So we're going to start. I, I presume we all know who these folks are, but let's let's go over it here. Our first speaker will be Barb Ockrey. Would you wait, please, Ms. Ockrey? <laughs> second, second speaker, Ron Anderson. Yeah. <laughs> Third speaker, Linda Paulus, and the fourth speaker, Eager Young. So we will, Ashley, thankfully, is handling all the tech. So the uh, we will be moving the uh, laptop along here, or Ashley will, so that folks at home can see also. And I suppose the folks at home couldn't see what I was saying. <laughs> Sorry, folks at home. <laughs> so, all right. So we'll get started with Barb then, and we, I won't reread the questions. I will presume that they're going to be addressing them along the way. No, Willie is going to keep time, and at about eight minutes, he'll let them know, and then we'll presume they're going to speak a few more minutes beyond that. So let's give them some applause to get them started. Does red mean this is on? Yes. It's no, on. green means it's on. Well, it's, it's, on. it's, it's red. On. It's on. It's on. I bet it fails in the middle. But we'll see. Uh, it's interesting. It was interesting to do this. Uh, it was kind of. See, I know it's still on. There you go. Yeah. Oh, it's still red. Okay. This is green. Thank you. It um, took me back over many years that I hadn't thought about for in various ways. So it was fun to do. It was also hard to get into eight minutes, so I better start. I was born a Presbyterian Hoosier in a city my dad loved to refer to as India No Place. I was the oldest of four children who grew up in a park, but to our delight have in recent years regularly met to enjoy reacquainting as adults. It's been a great to me. First question, Giger's, uh, Sally said was, what are some significant and meaningful themes? And for me, that's in my 76 years. I picked three. The first is the joy of learning and teaching as well, especially about the natural world. And this has remained a constant through my life, from family and camping, uh, family travel and camping all the way through college. And, graduate school in Texas and then the past 50 years in Minnesota. Second, I put the gift of having two wonderful children. I learned so much from them. See, that's still learning. And there are four daughters now about human nature and relationships. And many of their talents and interests greatly enriched my life. Third is challenges. And by that, I mean accepting and trying to grow from difficult changes. And I'll simply list three rather than going into them. Um, one was sorrow at the end of my marriage after 19 years. Another was the very sudden emergence of my son's bipolar disorder order when he was 19 or 20. It's like he completely changed. Very shocking to all of us. Another is very sudden, uh, no, that was a third challenge was the diagnosis, my diagnosis, surgery and chemo for ovarian cancer when I was 58. A shock in many ways. And a more recent challenge, which I added here, is one we all face if we're lucky. So that's a little bit different. Uh, and that is aging with its inevitable uh, losses. For me, that is featured loss of family and friends, and that's probably true for everybody. And empty nest, true for many people, and Meniere's disease and neuropathy. 
So how did I come to Unitarianism? Four very slow steps. Way back in eighth or ninth grade, I had a friend who was a Unitarian in, in Indianapolis. And the way he explained his religion made so much sense to me. I didn't know why I was still a Presbyterian. But nevertheless, Presbyterianism was my family and my community, and I continued in that through high school. It was a big part of my life, as a matter of fact. Step two. When I moved in Duluth in 1972, to Duluth in 1976, first Unitarian, many of you remember that, or have seen it, in its lovely little Tudor building intrigued me. But I was totally turned off by a quote posted in the billboard in front of the building, which said something like, I can't remember it exactly, I should have taken a picture of it, it would be ironic right now. Um, the ignorant believe, the intelligent doubt. I just thought, thought that sounded so snobbish. I didn't care to be involved with such people in here. I am. But we don't put quotes like that outside, do we? Years later, after my divorce, I brought my teenage children back to the little Tudor building at 1802 a few more times. But I waited too long. They had their own peer communities and didn't need or want a new just community. Step four, ironically, it was my son and his wife who later brought me into the UU fold for good. It was Mother's Day. First Unitarian met at St. Ed's back at that time, and Karen Gustafson spoke movingly. After a long line of interesting people who took turns making announcements about a long list of intriguing events they cared deeply about. I don't know how many of you remember that they used to do that line up before the service and then make those announcements, which went on forever and interfered with the service, which is why we don't do it anymore. But I was intrigued anyway, because there were lots of interesting people. How could anyone, I wondered, not believe in those beautifully crafted and utterly true seven principles? I was hooked and finally became a member and have stayed through five building changes, more than five minister changes, I can't count them, one name change, and most recently, one additional principal. Some special memories of UM, UUCD and committee board involvement, I combined those. It's really the people and all you've taught me. And I could have gone on here forever. I wanted to, I found myself wanting to mention everybody that had been significant in this congregation, and there's no way I could do that. So, first committee work, special events, chaired by the inimitable Dodie Bertelson, who has been described as a party on wheels. She was totally different from anything I've met before. Caring. This wasn't through the caring committee, but it's my first receiving of caring that I remember. <clears throat> Giger Yant appearing at my front door shortly after my cancer, cancer surgery with the gift of my first ever salad spinner. I think I had to ask her what it was, <laughs> but I've used it ever since, believe me. Midwest Leadership School. On the drive to Beloit, getting to know Don Stevenson, who I miss, unfortunately. Um, is it eight minutes? One minute left. All right, well, don't, don't ask questions. Uh, anyway, I enjoyed getting to, to know her. Board work. Ron was on the board when I was uh, there. Don split the presidency one year with me, believe it or not. And uh, Ron was on the board. And I remember going to his home for an annual planning meeting. And I thought, but we can't remember, neither of us, that he was involved or really wanted to revise all the policies so that we would solve all the problems UUCD would ever encounter <laughs> once and for all. General Assembly in Cleveland, Ohio, that's where the Green Sanctuary Program came from. We've had programs about that, and I got to room with Karen Gustafson. It's an interesting perspective to room with a minister at, at GA. Green Sanctuary Committee, so many powerful role model teachers for living well on the earth. I won't go into the detail there. Climate Action Team, 
I wanted to say that I wanted to start life over but after Green Sanctuary. All you people in Green Sanctuary taught me so much about living. I wanted to start life over and do it right. But Climate Action Team is a good antidote for that because they solve problems today, now. And I learned a lot from them as well. Soul Matters with Reverend Bruce, a chance to think in new ways and to know people a little more deeply. My group is the reason I'm no longer intimidated by the concept of blessing and a lot of other concepts similar to that. Outdoor Sanctuary Group, planning first wild garden outside the East End with Joan Sutherland and the RA Kids. And last but not least, the Good Food Group. In addition to introducing the Gardener's Market, we look forward to reviving our harvest potluck this coming year. It's been in absentia for COVID. Um, many, time, many times recently. What keeps me coming? I'm not doing a great job of that since COVID and since aging has slowed me down, but I hope to find a new small niche. And the answer to that question must still be after all of these years, it's the principles and the people. Thank you. Thank you, Barb. And Ron, over to you. All right. I'm glad that she was able to tell her everything. I don't even need to talk anymore. So, oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so I'll do. Uh, I expect uh, 15, 20 minutes since I've been here. I've misplaced my notes that I worked on yesterday, so I'm going to just wing it. So, this is probably a one minute thing. So, Anyway, brief, I, over, brief overview of, excuse me, <laughs> uh, brief uh, uh, overview of my life experiences. Uh, well, I suppose uh, uh, I was born into a family. I was the oldest of five. My parents divorced, and that was uh, when I was very young. So I ended up being the father of my siblings. So, uh, but anyway, uh, we all we all survived and I think everybody's doing well. Nobody ended up in jail. Um, let's see, I was born, uh, let's see, uh, 1934, so I've been around a while. I'll be 90 in about a month. <laughs> Uh, I thought if I could make it to 60, that would have been a big deal. So anyway, I'm here. Uh, I have, uh, let's see, I, I married my wife and we've had uh, three boys. Uh, my wife has been dead for about four or five years now. And a lot of you know Barb, and she was something else. Uh, great woman. Uh, my, uh, my, boy, my boys all ended up in college. Uh, one has got a PhD in engineering. Uh, that's interesting because I can't even add two and two, much less uh, I've got uh, two engineers and uh, one uh, business manager in, in for my three kids. They all, they all, they've all done well. Uh, I've exposed them to the Sunday school here, but uh, I don't think anybody, uh, none of my kids are going to church, so they've kind of chucked it all. <laughs> I don't know if we did such a bad job or what, but anyway, uh, they're all they're all doing well. They uh, and I have uh, four grandchildren uh, who don't live around here, so we don't see them very often, but. Uh, uh, it's surprising. Uh, I think all of them have been in college or are in college at the present time, so it tells you how long that's been. Uh, and they're doing well. Uh, I think, uh, you know, getting married was a big thing in my life. We'll start out with that. Uh, I also uh, I uh, was in service right after uh, the Korean War ended, so I was over there in Korea 
uh, the year after things settled down, but people will still get the shot and all that kind of stuff. And I, but I was in radar, so I was sitting on a mountaintop, and the Marines were de defending us. So uh, they still think about that. But uh, uh, my wife and I went back to uh, Korea because we were invited back about, I think it was three or four years ago now, that Barb and I went over there. And of course, uh, Korea, when I left uh, as a serviceman, there was, there was a mud hot thing with uh, the roof uh, full of grass, and that was it. Now you go over there, it's like living in uh, New York City. Uh, the Koreans have done a fantastic job. If you know, if, uh, you know any Korean people, they, you know they're very bright, and uh, that four, I think it's 40,000 people that live there. Uh, they're, they've really done a great job. If you ever get a chance to go over to Japan or Korea and stuff, it's, it would be a real good trip. They treat you well. Uh, what other things in my life? Uh, I guess when I think about it, it's a very common thing. I had no big, serious things happen to me, and I guess uh, man, that's about all I can say about that. Uh, how did they become a Unitarian? Uh, let's see, I, my wife and I were busy with the group here. Uh, no, I mean, not, not in here, when I came to Duluth. And uh, then we ended up meeting some Unitarians, and so I, we went to the church there. And I evidently uh, bought into it because I, Barb and I joined the church way back in. I think it was like old six. Uh, so it's back there a ways. Um, Let's see, what else? So I, I was on the board uh, many times, I guess. I can't remember all. I was in the board, I was board president a couple of times, and I was on all kinds of committees, and including building this building here. I was involved in that, too. So uh, it brings back memories. Um, how did I become a Unitarian? Well, I, when I came to Duluth, I, uh, my wife and I were already, uh, after being in uh, Rapid City for a couple of years and meeting other people there, uh, I went from uh, being a Lutheran to not buying anything. And when I came to Duluth, I started looking up for a church that didn't, wasn't doing anything. <laughs> Anyway, that's, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, uh, no, uh, no I, I, I really, uh, when I was in Salt Lake City, I was going to the, the church over, over there uh, a little while, and then we came to Duluth, I started looking around, and we found a little church down on 4th Street, and so I got real busy on that. The lost is found. Where, where did you find it? Barb, Barb Monty. Uh, who's building, you know, a building guru, and she found them. I don't know. I'll be darned. <laughs> well, but keep going. You're I, doing great. I spent uh, three hours doing this, so you want to hear that. So, anyway, <laughs> uh, well, how do I was in Salt Lake City? I met a gal who was a Unitarian, and I, my wife and I were already thinking about. Uh, I being Lutheran and she was a Congregationalist, we didn't either, we didn't buy any of it, so uh, we, we uh, ended up uh, going to the church in Salt Lake City and then when it came to Duluth, uh, that's how I ended up uh, looking for the Unitarian Church, so I guess I was already thinking about doing, uh, chucking my Lutheranism back way back when. Uh, let's see. What? You're good. Right? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> You're great. Uh, special memories. 
I don't have any special memories of you. you everything, all my memories of this church have been good. But that's all I can say about that. What keeps me back coming? Because I like to be around people who think like I do. Uh, I don't need to put up with uh, my Luther friends anymore. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Considering that you didn't have your notes, sir, you did a fine job. So we're going to move over to Linda Paulus now. Thank you. And first to say it's an honor to be here and that you showed up. I'm really, yeah. It's a good day for me and I hope for you. Uh, my journey, I would say in terms of being a church person, as I said to Bruce, uh, Johnson a number of years ago. Well, my mother was a church lady, and I'm a church lady too, but I do come by it naturally. I grew up in a little town under 2,000 people, no immediate relatives in that town, but the church was my extended family, and that was Methodist Church. And um, I would say, okay, so that's, that's a formative thing in how I came to be me. Uh, the next thing I would mention, uh, very important in how I came to be me, was meeting and marrying an Oneida man by the name of Bob Paulus. And so for each of us to, to marry is a very important formative thing. In my case, it was an intercultural marriage, not only interracial, but intercultural in terms of uh, my family was very established, no divorces, no this, no that. Uh, whereas he came from a good deal of poverty. Uh, he came from a situation where, well, where lots of things were said that would create his life and make it very different than mine. Uh, and to, to speak to someone more recently, but their parents have said, no, 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 don't marry that person. And I said, yes, it will be more of a challenge, but it will also be far more enriching that I grew tremendously as having been forced to recognize, to deal and assimilate much of what my husband's culture was. And I'm, I'm glad for that. I rejoice in it. Uh, Bob and I you know, were regular human beings. We weren't always easy to live with, but we had a strong commitment to each other. Uh, another thing in uh, overall life experiences, I would say art. That uh, 35 years ago when we came back to Duluth, I thought I had a job in student personnel. I didn't. So I said, well, I'll just go to the Art Institute and work on that. And I've worked on my art a great deal these last 35 years. Not that I've produced uh, masterpieces, but I have found myself in the process of pursuing that. One of my favorite things to say is, okay, you start a project, that's a great idea, and it isn't working out. The clay decides to do something else. Okay, we had plan A, but you always have plan B, and you feel okay with plan B. Plan B is also honorable. That's an important thing in uh, my life experiences. How did I come to be a Unitarian? Uh, I guess back in that Methodist church, I knew I wasn't being saved on Sunday night. I just knew I wasn't. I couldn't stand up and go aside for prayer. I just, I couldn't do it. I loved the people, but I never quite told them my secret because I didn't want to be too controversial. Uh, the next thing I would say regarding my life, uh, my mother came from a Christian science family. Then they went to Congregational, which is kind of sisterly. Um, but the thing about Christian science that my mother 
exemplified to me is you always do the absolute most you can to take care of yourself. And then when there are people like medical institutions that can help you, you let them help you. But there is primarily that self-responsibility. My dad on the other side was a Methodist minister's son, and he had every bottle of pills you could hope to find. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, OK, so um, is that how I came to Unitarianism? Uh, a very important thing in my life was going off to college and kind of haphazardly uh, designing a um, degree in education, secondary education history. And I just got to liking intellectual history of the United States. And by golly, if I didn't find out, all the ancestors were not Methodists. <laughs> and they were not all the same kinds of Christians. But heaven forbid that there were anything but Christians. And uh, I guess toward the end of, of that uh, emphasis in history, I was really thinking about Ralph Waldo Emerson. And that was really eating away at my Methodism. Finally, the, the, the clincher was a church member, some of you may remember, Lucy Walbridge. And Lucy had a son in kindergarten with my son. And one day she said to me, Linda, I think you would like the Unitarian Church. And so I said, OK, Lucy, what time? <laughs> and that was, that was the beginning of that. And so we signed the book. Oh, no, I, no, let's see. We signed the book in 1979. I probably started in 77. And Bob gradually came along with me. So I did influence him, too. Uh, special memories of UUCD. Uh, the music. I'm a sucker for music. Anytime you might see me in the back row crying as soon as we got to the second verse because the words were so powerful for my being. Uh, the day that my picture showed up on the front page of the newspaper, me singing with the Pride Choir, and then getting some letters from people who were very disturbed that I was spending my life supporting that sort of thing. But that was a powerful something for me. Committee and board involvement. Uh, I got, I came back to Duluth in 89 and very shortly thereafter, Giger said to me, come on, I think you'd be okay on the finance committee. So that was a wonderful way for me to get an overview of the church's operations. I served a couple years on the board, and then I took a long sabbatical, <laughs> but I came back. I came back when both my children were having problems in their lives, and my heart was breaking. I needed my friends. I needed people who were seeking after things in the same manner as I was. And so that's, that's how I came back in about mm, 1910, 2010. Uh, what, what, keep, what, keeps, what keeps me coming back? Ha, ah, had no trouble writing this word down. Community. This is, this is an extended family for me. I, you know, I, it's part of my childhood, just evolving some more. Uh, what keeps me coming back? In more recent years, the Buddhist study group keeps me coming back because I sense changes in my being and I sense a commonality with a number of people around here. Um, music keeps coming, that is, is something that uh, keeps me coming back. Uh, yeah, I, 
you're you're all current members you you know about that and then i have a section that i call more moreover <laughs> okay so being alone that's a challenge you learn about yourself in yet more ways because you don't have that old friend anymore at least not in body um being alone uh my brain is slower. I think that that's part of what I got from Indian culture, but it's also something that's just part of my physiology now, that I am not the most verbal, although you might not know it, uh, <laughs> at jumping right in there. I tend to take my time, no, but that's, and that's all right. Uh, culture. Nowadays, I'm very often willing to grin for you and say, well, I'm a little bit crazy, and I hope you are too. In other words, to be just a little bit off the track from whatever is supposed to be normal. Uh, another thing, um, confidence. Through these years, I, I, ex I expressed it somewhat with my discussion of art, but confidence confidence that you can go to plan B, confidence when your husband is dying of Alzheimer's that you can handle this. I have chosen to handle this. I will handle this. <laughs> oh, I'm at zero. <laughs> uh, so um, sure enough, it's your turn, Willie. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. going to take, have a time for questions afterwards, so over Thank to you, Peter. <laughs> I'm glad I'm at the end of the list. Um, I have always had difficulty sitting in the box, and um, so I may or may not follow the pattern that Sally and Carol put out for us. But here's the deal. I'm in my ninth decade. I started on this earth in 1940 as the daughter of a pair of parents, marvelous people. I'm telling you, they have weathered well. They, they were grounded and they were consistent uh, in what they said and what they did and what they didn't do. So um, they were professional educators in the public school system of South Carolina, and they were passionate that everybody had the right and the need for an education to read, write, and think. Now, <clears throat> 1940, of course, really um, had a lot of white water since then all along the way. But one of my memories, and my mother and I had lovely times together in the kitchen, the two of us. Um, when I was almost two years old, on a Sunday evening, my mother was giving me a, a bath with the radio on. And she was told that we had things going on in Pearl Harbor. Well, who's ever heard of Pearl Harbor? But I was too young to quite grasp the, the dynamics and the invested daily lives of people in this country and across the world dealing with World War II. I, I've absorbed that sort of thing in hindsight. It was, it was a dynamic time. Then, um, let me see, where have I gone? Of course, okay, so my family roots on both sides are Lutheran, the rural agrarian, uh, as America was in, in those days, um, in the land. They knew how to grow crops, they knew how to grow animals, they knew how to take care of each other. My grandfather on my mother's side was a physician and um, served in the um, 
Confederate struggles. Um, there was no anesthesia in those days, can you imagine? And I just feel like we looped back in this decade with the chess game that's going on in the earth with uh, tormenting people, just messing around and having wow. these power struggles. But I digress, don't I? I love to digress. <laughs> because that's how life is. But in any case, um, I was, I, I skipped, but the name of the town where I was born was Bennisville with double everything, like Mississippi. <laughs> you know, Bennisville had two of these and two of those and two of that. It doesn't fit in a box on a computer. But um, by the 50s, um, the 1950s, my second decade, I was, we, the family was living in York County and uh, in the midst of Presbyterians. Of course there were Baptists and Methodists, but there was not a, a Lutheran church in our community, so I belonged to the Presbyterian youth group. But on Saturdays, when I got to the right age, every Saturday we would go over the state line to Kings Mountain, North Carolina, where I did catechetical classes. And if any of you are Lutherans, you probably did that. You, you, you know, the little, my husband says, these are the questions and these are the answers. <laughs> In the little book. <laughs> well, the minister, uh, my takeaway from those Saturday mornings was, first of all, he was interesting. Secondly, we got to the miracles. And, some of you have probably been exposed to the miracles. And he talked about the water into wine. And he said, um, are miracles still happening? And I don't know if any of us answered, but he did. He said, yes, water is still turning into wine. Water into grapes, grapes into wine element is time. It takes time for miracles to come along and to fruition. So we're all on our journeys and I'm journeying along in the 50s. The 50s were dramatically different than the 40s in the United States and it was my time still wondering how people What's going on? Who are people? What is the truth? What is what's there to be learned? And I was drawn to older people, really older people, you know, who had lived in earlier times before automobiles and before this and before that. And little children and a little digression here. Back in the 70s, I had four little children under my care, and Linda was out doing her thing for the, I, I don't know, maybe the YWCA. So I'm just getting acquainted because we really still knew in town. And so I asked, I invited Blair to tell me about his grandparents. And Blair said, my blue-eyed grandma or my brown-eyed grandma? I knew and I loved how he was distinguishing his biracial uh, roots and the richness in, in his life. And of course, I've loved Blair forever. So um, I, it was, I couldn't reconcile. I was not doing a good job of reconciling segregation, the black and white, and the, the Christian stuff red and yellow, black and white, and missions, and we're going to Africa, and we're going to save everybody. And I don't know, I loved what I was learning about Africa in the geography classes in the Congo, and wow, and you know, I've always thought Africa was really the place to do, I don't know, really special. And the people I knew who had, had come from that um, part of the world, 
and, and wound up in North America were interesting and rich with uh, joy, I would say, in spite of the hardships and inequities. So um, one of the things that I was fortunate to know was a lot of people who had college degrees and a lot of people who didn't, maybe they dropped out for all sorts of reasons, but they, 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 they were wise and educated. And so while I was in a family where what you do is finish high school and go to college, that's just what you do, girls and boys from my <clears throat> ancestral roots, but I knew people with bachelor's degrees who couldn't handle whatever there was to be handled. I mean, you know, as my mother said when I said, what's with so-and-so? She said, he's a poor manager. So I know, I'm so thankful to know that there's a lot you can learn in formal education and there's a lot that you might not get there. Wisdom and worth are not directly correlated and excluded in one or the other. It's that way across the boards. And how many? Oh, oof. so got through the 50s, got into the 60s, and by this time, um, David and I, of course, are married and we are about to have our first child. And so we're getting a little more serious about our Christian disbeliefs and what we wanted for integrity about what we were going to be teaching our children or exposing them to. And so um, he had a colleague at work who grew up in New England and was a Unitarian. We were in Charleston and <laughs> have the good fortune to go to Charleston. You will know on Archdale Street, two of the oldest churches, one is Lutheran and the other is Unitarian. The current, current minister at that Unitarian church in Charleston grew up in this congregation. She did. Look it up. Google that congregation. What's her name? Her name's Rebecca Hines. Okay. Remember Rebecca? Mm -hmm. And so I, I've got to hurry along because life keeps moving. So anyway, um, David and I, I've always been a UU. My mother gave me books, the Martin and Judy books, that I, my favorite, some of my favorite childhood books. They were written by one of the greatly esteemed religious education writers in the UU, in the Unitarians, because at that time it was just Unitarians. Um, so we, we um, transitioned ourselves uh, into being UUs, and we were in a little fellowship in Athens, Georgia, and then we were in one of the biggest UU congregations in the country, in Arlington, Virginia, before we moved to Duluth in 1976. Um, I, I will tell you with leaving out a whole lot of fun stuff here that um, extended family program is probably one of the richest things that has happened to us in our lifespan as you use. And the first year that we were here in Duluth and didn't know anybody and had come into this tiny, tiny little congregation, um, the minister was a young woman from California, and she proposed that our congregation take up the um, extended family program, and we did. And um, so that was, our, our family made, was three generations um, uh, from 1976 to the present, and, and it, it's got rich memories. Um, one of my fun memories from 1802, the little Tudor church, is um, our son 
going up in the choir loft and taking the uh, uh, orders of service and folding them into airplanes and, and teaching younger little boys how to poof these down into the coffee hour that was going on in the back of the congregation. Um, I was, <clears throat> it was suggested that maybe I wasn't the best parent letting my kid run around <laughs> and fly things, but um, it did. And I'm gonna just wrap, wrap it up there, but why? We, we are UUs because that's who we are, David and I. We think, we care about what we think, we're responsible for what, what we think. And um, I'm, I'm just deeply offended. As a child, I was deeply offended by this Christian one, one the, the truth and the way of being, which was not Lutheran so much as it was Christian, of course, and, and there's all sorts of rivalry. But I'm not attracted to that at all as a way of thinking about things. Everybody's got values and insights, and um, I have not followed Sally's script, but I am really having fun being an old lady. <laughs> <laughs> We had four people and four totally different ways of approaching this. So thank you, one and all. And uh, <laughs> uh, I think we have a few minutes for questions. If anybody has any question that they have a burning question about one of these folks, can I see a hand here? Mr. Munger usually has something he has to ask. <laughs> He's stuck. <laughs> anyway, I'll. I'll I don't see any hands. Oh, so. the chat. oh, the chat. Just, Blake just said, thanks, Eager, Linda, Ron, and Barb. Loving learning more about each of you. Oh, Blake. Yeah. All right. Hi. Um, OK, so this is kind of a maybe too general of a question. But for young people growing up in the Unitarian Church now, obviously their experience is much different than what you all experience in your lives, but do you have any words of wisdom or advice to young people growing up in the Unitarian Church or in general today? I'll tell you, okay, it looks like we have a taker. I'll tell you what my son did. He made sure he had, no, this isn't working. Wait, wait a minute, I probably turned it off instead of a little he, he made sure that as he was reading to his children, and that was, that in itself was a religious ceremony. Every night there was reading. But Buddhist stories, Indian stories, Jewish stories, some Christian stories, but the notion that they understood from the get-go that it wasn't all one way. There's, of course, more to it than that, but that's one thing. Can you pass it? I wholeheartedly agree. I think there are wonderful things to learn through the RE curriculum and through all of it when they get to that age as well. Um, but I also think that we were, several of us, you noticed, grew up in church communities, even though they were not Unitarian. And I think that's probably the most important thing for kids. So have a friend, make a friend, bring a friend, bring three friends and really come consistently and form a community. And, and that, I think, is the most important thing for, one of the most important things for kids. Anyone else? Yeah. Make it a work. Yeah. Look for grandparents. Look for intergenerational experiences for your children. Uh, all my grandparents died before I was born, but I was passionate that my children were going to have grandparents and I have we've been very successful at that. I just have an addition to Ron's um, story for us. This has, um, when I first started coming here, that would have been in the, uh, when we were in Winona, and I um, 
you know, just, I didn't, of course, didn't know anyone. And everyone was so friendly and welcoming. And some, and, and there was going to be a meeting after church. It was going to be a big meeting, you know, like the annual something. And so I said, well, you know, that would be interesting to go to because I don't know any of these people. And someone took me, someone, a congregational member, took me under their arm, their wing, and we went downstairs to the cafeteria area. And um, they said, I will, I will tell you what's going on. And, you know, and tell you who these people are. And she said, especially watch this one man and listen to him because he always has something to say and it usually has to do with the finances. <laughs> and so anyway, um, you were a little bit, uh, you weren't exactly a troublemaker, but you uh, did have points to make and you thought about what was being said. I appreciate that. That's how I got to know Ron Anderson. <laughs> you have a history. Did anyone else have something to comment? Say, okay. I'm going to ask. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I just like to thank Geiger for the daughter that uh, was one of my all-time favorite students at East, who epitomizes the values of uh, UU's, and she's carried on your tradition. Admirably. Yeah. She cherished you in the moment and forever after. I believe that was Louise, was it? Yeah. yeah. All right. I'm sw swinging around one more time. We just had a couple of comments online. So one comment, um, which there's not a name associated with it, says, great presentation. Thanks so much to speakers and organizers. And then Rod Graff says, this was lovely. Thanks to everyone for taking the time to share of themselves. We had 14 people online um, watching. Oh. Well, we're going to end. I Speaking want to... of time. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, Mr. Rucker. Next time you ask me to be a timer, tell me if it's Unitarians or not. They, <laughs> they don't know how to tell time. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, we will end, and I'll let you know two things. There is, we have a lot of wise people in the Unitarian Church, so we're having another Elder Wisdom Forum on March 10th, where we'll have Sue Daly, Jan McGree, Charlie Moore, and Barb Kelly. So come back on March 10th to see the next group. <laughs>